straight talk from Israel. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. Political hitmen. I'm Howie Silverger, your political hitman right here on Israel News Talk Radio. Feel free to join me in the chat room at IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com, where the conversation's always happening, and uh, it's always fun. It's always fun in the chat room on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. You could also call in. The show is live, so feel free to call in. In North America, the number is 301-768-4841. In Israel, the number is 02650151. I, I got an email this week. Uh, a listener emailed me to complain. And I, I don't often share my complaint emails with you, but I, I thought I'd share this one because it's going to be the basis of the show t- today. So uh, the uh, listener was upset that uh, a week and a half ago, we had we well we passed the anniversary, the twenty fifth anniversary of the assassination of former Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. He was killed on November fourth, nineteen ninety five, and uh, twenty five years later, uh, I made a decision. It was a conscious decision. I knew about the anniversary of the death. I knew about the uh, I, I knew about the uh, the anniversary of the murder, and uh, I made a conscious decision not to talk about it on the show, to skip over it, to talk about other things to not talk about the, the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin 25 years later. And uh, there's reasons, there are, there are a lot of reasons I made that decision. Uh, a listener wrote in expressing their dismay that I did not talk about it. So on today's show, I want to talk a little bit about the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin and Yitzhak Rabin in general. Um, I, I have very strong opinions about Yitzhak Rabin. Uh, I knew the man. I've had conversations with the man. We'll talk about that when we come back. Because uh, I, I like answering listener emails. And, uh, and of course, when you, when you email me and tell me you're upset about something, I like to address it on the show. Uh, we are live, which means you could call in. The numbers are on the top of the page on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com, but I'll give them to you anyway. 301-768-4841 in North America and Israel 2 Six five zero zero one five one. You could join me in the chat room on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. I'm Howie Silberger. This is Political Hitman on Israel News Talk Radio. The return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel was prophesied in the Bible thousands of years ago and is coming true today. Shalom. Join me, Josh Wander, on Israel Unplugged. Listen in as we delve into the spiritual and physical aspects of the Jewish return to Zion. We'll discuss the biblically mandated, historic, and of course practical understandings of this incredible transition from exile to redemption. That's Israel Unplugged, every Monday on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. Political hitmen. I'm Howie Silberger, your political hitman, right here on Israel News Talk Radio. Feel free to call in. Numbers to call in North America, 301 768 4841. In Israel, the number is 02650151. Those are the numbers to call in. If you want to get on the conversation, you can join me in the chat room at IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com, where the chat is always happening and always fun. Join me in the chat room, IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. So I got an email, and uh, I, I read all my emails. I don't always respond, but I read all my emails. And the email I got was from a listener who was complaining that the 25th anniversary of Yitzhak Rabin's assassination, the former Prime Minister of Israel, Yitzhak Rabin, had come and gone, it was November 4th, they had come and gone, and I didn't address it on the show. And they said, your show's called Political Hitman, you should be addressing uh, these kind of things on your show. And I, I didn't respond to the email, I figured I'd respond on the air, so this is what I'm doing today. Um, and uh, I, uh, I decided that 
I was going to tell the truth. You know, a lot of a lot of radio show hosts, they they get on, uh, you know, when they get called out on, on something, they get on and they say, "Oh, I didn't think of it," or uh, "Nobody reminded me," or you know, make up some excuse. No, I knew about the anniversary of Yitzhak Rabin's assassination. I was well aware that the anniversary was uh, was was last week, uh, a week and a half ago, and I was well aware that I had a show. In fact, there were two shows between the anniversary and this show, and I am well aware that I did not cover the anniversary at all. It was a conscious choice. I um, I believe, like many people do, that Yitzhak Rabin was a sellout. I believe, like many people do, that Yitzhak Rabin was responsible for the death of many, many, many Israeli citizens. I believe, as many people do, that Yitzhak Rabin was a tyrant. And so, uh, I didn't feel it necessary to spend time to talk about Yitzhak Rabin's assassination. I didn't feel it was necessary to acknowledge uh, his assassination. Uh, I didn't agree with his assassination, so don't get me wrong and don't put words in my mouth. Um, I didn't agree with his assassination. I thought that, I think that assassinating any politician is repugnant, period. I do not believe that we should settle political differences through violence. Third world countries do that. Dictatorships do that. Democracies, or so-called democracies, should not be settling their political disputes through violence. At least not internally. Sure, wars and, uh, and, and taking care of terrorists is one thing. But political disputes, internal political disputes, I disagree with your political policy. I disagree with what you're doing to our country. Should not end in violence and should not end in murder, ever. If you don't like your politicians, there are democratic and uh, legal ways that you could remove your politicians. If enough people don't like the politicians, there are ways to remove the politician from office. Uh, Assassination should not be one of the options. Now, that said, uh, Yitzhak Rabin, and, and as I stated in the intro, I, 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 knew, I knew the man. I, I didn't know him well, but I, I, but I had met the man a, quite a few times. We've had, we had a few conversations. Uh, this all occurred while I was working uh, during the 1992 election campaign for Yitzhak Shamir. I had the opportunity to meet Yitzhak Rabin. Uh, and... and um, uh, he beat Shamir in that election. Uh, and uh, I, I didn't find the man likable, even in person. I, I was never really impressed with him. I was less impressed with his wife, Leah, who I had a few run-ins with uh, in Israel and then outside of Israel, as I worked as a journalist outside of Israel. Uh, the man did not like right-wing people. He did not like people who believed in the Jewish land of Israel. The man did not like... Uh, people who are advocates for the Jewish land of Israel, for settling the Jewish land of Israel, for living in the in the sacred heart of Jewish Israel. The man had no patience at all for people who were living there and who were advocating protecting their homes from terrorists that were coming to kill them. In fact, he took many people who protected their homes or people who uh, who advocated protecting your homes and put them under house arrest for national security reasons. The man negotiated a peace deal. Well, first, before he did that, he revived the Palestinian Liberation Organization, which, has, which was a dead organization. And he revived that organization and brought Arafat basically back from the political dead in order to in order to um, in order to uh, to to negotiate the Oslo Accords, which, if if they were implemented, would have been the destruction of the state of Israel. It would have led to the eventual destruction of the state of Israel and the creation of an Arab entity uh, on the land that is currently Israel. It would have been it would have been disastrous had it been actually implemented the way it was signed. It would have been disastrous for the state of Israel. It would have been disastrous for the Middle East, and it would have been rewarding terrorists for killing Jewish people. This, to me, was unacceptable. 
majorly unacceptable. And uh, when I expressed my view to Yitzhak Rabin, to his face, he, he explained to me, he said to me, uh, and he quoted Golda Meir saying, listen, you, you, don't make, you don't make peace with your friends. You only make peace with your enemies. Our enemies happen to kill us. And so we must negotiate with our enemies who are trying to kill us, and we must make peace with our enemies. Now, while I understand the concept, uh, I understand the political concept that you can't make peace with friends. There's no reason to negotiate peace with friends. I also understand the political concept that a government should be there to protect their citizenship. And that a prime minister's sole job, or a president or prime minister, or the leader of the country's sole job, is to protect their citizens. Is to ensure that their citizens are happy and healthy and well protected militarily and, uh, and safe. Yitzhak Rabin failed in that. He failed miserably in that. Knowing full well that Yasser Arafat was lying and that Yasser Arafat had no intention of ever living up to any agreement he made with Israel, he sat down and negotiated and forced Israel to follow an agreement which would lead to the ultimate destruction of the state and have been fully implemented. To me, that's treacherous. That's treacherous. To me, that is absolutely horrific. And any government that did that should have fallen immediately. But it didn't. And on the White House lawn, under the, uh, under the close eye of Bill Clinton, Yasser Arafat and Yitzhak Rabin shook hands. He shook hands with Yasser Arafat. And they signed the agreement. So what, what did this agreement lead to? What, what, what happened? So what was supposed to happen and what did happen? It's, it's a good question. So what was supposed to happen was there were supposed to be, um, there were supposed to be um, uh, independent areas where the Arabs that called themselves Palestinians, this, this fake group of Arabs, the, uh, the, the pawns that were created by the Arab League, in order to destroy Israel from the inside, we're going to be independent uh, on these on these lands, and Israel is going to supply them with guns uh, and 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 training so that they they could build a police force. They were going to be demilitarized, but they they were going to have an armed police force, and they were going to be joint patrols between Israel and and this group, and and they were going to patrol together and work together in peace and harmony, because the years and years and years of uh, uh, of the Arabs teaching their children that Israel is the devil and that the Jews must be destroyed, uh, apparently, apparently just disappeared with the signing of this document. So it was all perfectly okay to, to give guns to people who, had a, who have avowed to destroy the country and kill everybody in it. Uh, to give them guns was, was a great idea. And it worked out really well, because uh, if we take a look what happened right after the signing of the Oslo Accords, after Arafat gave a speech saying that you know, don't worry about us signing the Oslo Accords. Uh, it is the first step towards our recapturing of all of Palestine, which was the entire state of Israel. That's the speech he gave right after signing the Oslo Accords. He said it's just a ploy. It's our first step in, 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 in achieving our goals of destroying Israel and conquering all their land. So, so putting that aside and ignoring all that, which, which, which Rabin did and, sub- and subsequent governments did, including Netanyahu, uh, ignoring all that and hoping for peace, because Israel is always hoping for peace, even though they know that, that, that with this group, this particular group, it is virtually impossible to achieve peace. Aside from the fact that this group was not the elected representatives of the people living in the land, Hamas was. It was a democratic election. Remember, Jimmy Carter uh, supervised that election. So Rabin, <laughs> Rabin actually revived a, a, an organization that was, that was thrown out by their own people thrown out because they were corrupt and he brought them back to life to negotiate this peace deal which was a fake peace deal on their part on on, on the air part they, they never had any intention of following through and they launched an intifada an uprising right after signing the Oslo Accords, which killed many many jews so who came out the winner in all this who came out the winner in all this but yitzhak rabin didn't just start killing Jews after the signing of the Oslo Accords. That wasn't uh, that wasn't the beginning of his of his Jew killing career. 
and setting up things to kill Jews. When we come back, I want to talk about, uh, well, I want to tell you a little bit about Yitzhak Rabin pre-1948, pre the, uh, the, the founding of the State of Israel. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, about his actions then. And we'll see. We'll see how much of a hero Yusuf Rabin was and why I really didn't want to talk about his assassination. I'm Howie Sobiger. You could join me on, on the phone. You can call in in North America, 301-768-4841. In Israel, 0265-00151. You could join me in the chat room on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. I'm Howie Sobiger. This is Political Hitman on Israel News Talk Radio. Hi, everyone. This is Andrea Simento from Jerusalem, inviting you to drop everything and join me on my show, Pull Up a Chair. We'll visit this week's quirky stories, meet fabulous guests, and discover my Israel. Together, we'll laugh, shout, and explain the topics that make us say, hey, we've got to talk about that. So get comfortable and pull up a chair with me, Andrea Simento, every Thursday on Israel News Talk Radio. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Did you know this psalm and many others were composed by a Jewish shepherd and musician who later became a king? Would you like to know some of the inner meanings of psalms to help you connect with God and strengthen your soul? An exciting and easy to read book is now available, which will help you do just that. Software for the Soul, Psalms for Everyone, available on Kindle, Audible, and Amazon.com. Software for the Soul. Political Hitman. I'm Howie Silberger, and this is Political Hitman right here on Israel News Talk Radio. Call in in North America, 301-768-4841. In Israel, the number is 0265-00151. You could join me in the chat room on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com, where the conversation is always happening. And uh, it's always fun to listen to, and it's always fun to read. So uh, join me in the chat room on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. But I prefer if you called in, because it's always nice to talk to you. So we're talking about the Rabin assassination. I didn't plan on doing a show on the Rabin assassination because uh, I really didn't think it should be a, um, I mean, it's, it's notable because the president of the state of Israel, the prime minister of the state of Israel was assassinated. So it's notable that he was assassinated. But I didn't think that we should make a big deal about his assassination, except for condemning the concept of assassinations. We shouldn't, we should never encourage anybody to kill a politician because they disagree with their politics. That is lunacy, and that should never happen. Um, but at the same time, at the same time, uh, commemorating the death of Yitzhak Rabin seemed a little crazy to me because Yitzhak Rabin himself was a Jew murderer. And, and because he murdered Jews, and he openly um, and consciously did it, it, it kind of made me, it kind of makes me a little uncomfortable saying that, uh, that, uh, that I'm mourning the death of Yitzhak Rabin. Because uh, I'm really not mourning the death of Yitzhak Rabin. Uh, I didn't think he should be killed. And uh, I don't think any politician should be killed. But at the same time, I really don't, I really don't have, um, have any remorse for his death. I mean, if he would have died from natural causes, I wouldn't be upset about it either. Um, I'm only upset because he was a politician that was assassinated. And that should never happen in any democratic state. He should have been removed from office for other reasons, uh, essentially treason. Uh, he should not have been um, assassinated. That was totally wrong. Okay, so moving on. Uh, before the founding of the State of Israel, Yitzhak Rabin was a, uh, was a general in the army. He was fighting. And, um, and I heard, you know, we, we all know the story of the Altalena. Uh, most people who, who have studied Israeli history know the story of the Altalena. The Haganah and the Irgun were fighting each other, and they were fighting the British, trying to establish the state of Israel. And uh, the Irguns, and, and they were trying to get, um, they were trying to get armaments. They were trying to get guns and and uh, and tanks and and trucks and and rifles and ammunition uh, in order to fight the war of 1948. And so uh, the Irgun went on a, a campaign across Europe, trying to raise. Uh, trying to raise the um, funds, trying to find the um, funds, money, and ornaments uh, to send to Israel to help the the battle, and they got this old ship called the Altalena. It was an old, uh, it was an old, uh, an old boat, 
And um, now, now we all know the historical aspect of this. We all, we all read the historical aspect of it. We've heard it at one point or another. And if you haven't, I, I advise you to look up the story of the Altalena. Um, I heard the story of the Altalena firsthand from a man uh, who was who was one of the organizers of finding the guns and 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 the tanks that went onto the ship. Uh, his name was Dan Nimrod, and he lived in France at the time. And Dan, the, Dan Nimrod, the late Dan Nimrod, he um, he organized the, um, the the he organized the the effort in France, and they were able to get a couple of tanks, and they were able to get a couple of guns, and they loaded up on the Altalena. And he was supposed to be on the ship, but but his wife couldn't go, so he he stayed back in France uh, to stay with his wife. And the ship took off without him. When the ship got to the shores of Tel Aviv. The Haganah knew that if the Irgun got the weapons that were on that ship, then the Irgun would be the stronger army in the state of Israel, and they would take the lead over the Haganah, and the right wing would form the first government of the state of Israel. They knew this uh, straight up. This was not a secret. They knew this. uh, It it was obvious. So David Ben-Gurion decided that even though the guns and the tanks, and the ammunition, and all the stuff that was on the ship, including the fighters that were on the ship, would actually win the war for the Jews. He did not want to see Menachem Begin, the leader of the Irgun, become the first prime minister of the state of Israel. So he sent his general, Yitzhak Rabin, and a platoon of men to the beach of Tel Aviv. And when the ship came over the horizon and were, was visible, and they stopped and requested permission to come to Tel Aviv to unload, they opened fire on the ship. Mortar shells, guns, and they sank the Altalena. But not only did they sink the Altalena and lose all the ornaments that were on the ship and sink everything, the guns and the tanks and everything else that was on the ship, not only did that happen, but the men who were on the ship, raised white flags as they fell into the water. And they, were, they had white flags on their, on their arms as they were trying to swim back to shore. They opened fire on these men in the water too, killing a few of them. Their goal, and, uh, and I, I, heard this, I heard this from uh, Dan and I heard this from a couple of other people that, that I knew that were involved and that were there. Uh, Dan wasn't there, but I heard it from people who were there. The goal was to kill Menachem Begin. They wanted to kill him so that he wouldn't take over the country. It didn't succeed. They didn't kill Menachem Begin. Now, Yitzhak Shamir, who I worked for uh, during his election campaign in 1992, he told me that he remembered vividly that every day after that, after the, after the Knesset, was, um, after Knesset was, was, was put into establishment, the State of Israel was put into establishment, the Knesset, the Parliament of the State of Israel, was, was built, uh, after that, every single day that they went in to work in the Knesset, and Menachem Begin passed Yitzhak Rabin, he always told him, and David Ben-Gurion, because they sat kind of near each other, he always told them that he will never forget what they did to the Jews. And, and, and that always struck me. When I heard that story, it always struck me that if Menachem Begin, who was there, and they tried to kill him, uh, said, you know, reminded these guys on a daily basis for years and years and years that he would never forget that they tried to kill him. And he would never forget the political violence that they started. Uh, I, I think that I would prefer to commemorate that and remember that than the assassination of Yitzhak. Uh, I think it's, it's more important to remember that just because these men founded the state of Israel, just because these men were the first, were the first government, they formed the first government of the state of Israel, we can't put them up on pedestals and call them heroic. They were heroic to a certain extent. I mean, they fought, they 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 battled, they 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 won. That that is that is slightly heroic. That 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 you could you could say that that was heroic. They weren't the only ones fighting. There were other people fighting too. Uh, they were just the the strongest ones, the the biggest faction fighting. So you could say that's heroic, and I, I would agree that 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 is heroic. But the means to get to the end kind of takes away the the shine. At the end, so if you if you commit evil acts to eventually create a good, do your evil acts 
cancel out the good acts that you did? Is it possible that you could be an evil person and you could commit you could commit murders and you could uh, you could do everything in the name of uh, in the name of peace? You could you could uh, you you could sign deals that 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 murdered people that that caused that caused death and destruction and that caused families to fall apart and communities to be ripped up and still be considered a good person. Is that is that possible? And that's the question I struggle with with uh, Yitzhak Rabin. I don't think it's possible. I'm not so sure that you could still be considered a hero, that you could still be considered a good person, that's still considered uh, somebody that we should look up to and sh- look up to in awe when you were responsible for the murders of so many people. I mean, we, we don't look... Uh, look, society's weird. Society is crazy. And sometimes they, they glorify gangsters and they glorify, uh, they glorify uh, serial killers and they glorify all sorts of crazy people. And we see this all the time, the glorification of, uh, uh, of crime and the glorification of murder. But it's not right. Now, I know people are going to tell me, and I know the person who wrote me the original email is going to tell me, hey, Howie, this was the kind of talk that happened before the Ribbon assassination. This was the talk that ramped up the rhetoric and, and, for, and, and caused the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin. I disagree because I really believe that the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin happened because they were ripping up, they were ripping up cities, they were ripping up cities of people uh, and, and displacing thousands and thousands and thousands of Jews. And there were a segment of Jews who really, honestly, disagreed and wanted to protect the Jewish country and felt that these men, Yitzhak Rabin and Shimon Peres, we're destroying the country. And this was their warped way. It was wrong. It was 100% wrong, but it was their warped way of trying to stop the carnage. Sometimes, even, the military, even militarily, sometimes sacrificing one man could save many others. And I think this is what was going through the minds of the people who plotted the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin. Were they right? No, they weren't. Were were they were they misguided? For sure. And I think anybody who commits any terrorism is misguided. Anybody who murders anybody is misguided. The only time we should be murdering people is when we know that they're going to murder other people. So so that's you know, killing is misguided. Um did it stop the Oslo Accords? Did it achieve its goal? Absolutely not. In fact, they signed Oslo II after that, and, and, uh, and they continued to dissect the state of Israel, continued to, uh, to, to and, and the Arabs continued to murder the Jews of the state of Israel. So nothing really changed. It's, it's quite amazing. I'm Howie Silberger. This is Political Hitman right here on Israel News Talk Radio. Feel free to call in. In North America, the number is 301-768-4841. In Israel, number 0265001. We'll be back right after this. Are you interested in transforming your life, drawing closer to the Creator, and uncovering the deeper meanings and hidden treasures in the Hebrew Bible? Then join me, Rav Yitzhak Michelson, and me, William Hall, on the Science of Kabbalah, where we are seeking to narrow the gap between what we understand of our physical and spiritual worlds. So make sure to tune in every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Israel time, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, here on Israel News Talk Radio. Political Hitman. I'm Howie Sobiger, your political hitman, right here on Israel News Talk Radio. Feel free to join me in the chat room at IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com, where the chat is always fun. And, of course, you can call in. The show's live. In North America, the number is 301-768-4841. In Israel, the number is 25 So what is the legacy of Yitzhak Rabin? Aside from the fact he was assassinated, because that seems to be the only thing anybody remembers him for. Um, 
if you go to North America, almost every city in North America, almost every federation, United Jewish Federation in North America, has a Yitzhak Rabin commemoration or a Yitzhak Rabin park somewhere or a commemoration for his assassination where they get together and they, and they reminisce about Yitzhak Rabin and the fact that he was killed. If your only legacy... And the only thing that you know, thing that people could talk about you is the fact that you got killed. Uh, then you really didn't live your life so well, in my opinion. Uh, Rabin, his legacy is a destructive, horrific peace agreement with a terror organization that didn't take it seriously. A lack of enforcement of the peace agreement, the lack of uh, of forcing the terror organization to actually live up to their end of the bargain, the lack of sanctioning the terror organization when they didn't live up to their end of the bargain, the imprisonment of Jews through house arrests because he didn't like their politics, the, the revival of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, an organization that continues till today killing Jews, and the strengthening of Hamas, the legitimately elected government of the people who who live in the Palestinian zones of the Oslo Accord. So how did he strengthen Hamas? So we, we know that they revived the PLO to replace Hamas as the official elected people. Uh, in fact, they they even changed all the Wikipedia entries and uh, and most of the um, and most of the history. The left wing has changed most of that to to reflect that the uh, that the people who voted in that election actually elected the PLO, which was not true at all. They elected Hamas by vast majority. After that election, uh, Hamas was uh, was was not accepted uh, by the Israelis or the Americans. So the Israelis and the Americans worked together to build up Yasser Arafat and the PLO and then started a civil war between the PLO and Hamas uh, in the in Judea and Samaria and in Gaza. In Judea and Samaria, the, the Americans and the Palestinian Liberation Organization, with the help of the Israelis, managed to put Hamas, pull, push Hamas out of Judea and Samaria. And in Gaza, Hamas managed to push the PLO out and kill whatever PLO people were left there. So that's why Hamas is in Gaza now and the PLO is in, uh, in Judea and Samaria. Uh, so the separation of, uh, of the two entities and the creation of a de facto Palestinian state, if you want to call it that, in Gaza. And then the launching of missiles from Gaza into the state of Israel was all a result of Yitzhak Rabin's policies during his time as prime minister in the early 90s. Now, Ariel Sharon didn't help the fact when he was prime minister by removing Jews from Gaza. Unilaterally withdrawing from Gaza was not a good move strategically, nor was it a good move religiously, nor was it a good move for the state of Israel. It was an appeasement move for the world body to say, look, Israel wants peace with these people, and it's these people that don't want the peace. But by doing that, Ariel Sharon condemned Southern Israel to tens, hundreds of thousands of rockets that rain on their heads till today. This is all a result of Yitzhak Rabin's policies. Now, I was at a speech just uh, about a year after Rabin's assassination. His wife, Leah Rabin, was launching a, uh, a fundraising um, uh, arm for one of the universities in Israel. And I ended up going to the speech to cover it as a journalist. And I stood there and she came out and I wanted to ask her a question. My question was, she was talking about how saintly her husband was and how he treated everybody equally. And uh, there were no, and, and uh, he didn't discriminate against any Israeli at all, ever. And she came out, and I went up to her, and I said, Mr. Rabin, I just have one question for you. And she looked at me, and she saw my yarmulke on my head. She saw my, uh, my skull cap, my kippah. And she said to me, I'm sorry, I don't talk to people like you. And I said, people like me? Um, men? Reporters? I didn't understand what she was saying. But I understood very well what she was saying. 
uh, the right wing, uh, the, it wasn't even the right wing, the religious Jews were accused as a group of murdering Rabin. It was a religious Jew, it, it was a yarmulke wearing Jew that killed Rabin. And so all people who wear kippahs, all people who wear yarmulkes were, were, were condemned as murderers of Rabin. So when she saw my keep on my head, she looked at me and she said to me, I don't want to talk to people like you. So I said, but Mr. Rabin, I'm a reporter and I only have one question for you. You talked about how your husband was a saintly man. You talked about how he never discriminated against anybody. How do you explain that there were at least 200 people put under house arrest right after he signed the uh, Oslo Accords in Judea and Samaria. 200 Jews put under house arrest when he signed the Oslo Accords. How do you explain that? They, they called it protective custody. What were they protecting them from? And she looked at me and she said to me, how dare you ask me that question? So I, um, I smiled and I, I, I said to her again, I'm just trying to understand, Mrs. Rabin, your husband's legacy is that he hated the right wing, he hated the religious, and he discriminated against people who had different political points of view than he had. How could you get up publicly and state that, that there was a difference? It, it's on the record. In fact, when this was happening, when, when the speech was happening, some of these people were still under house arrest. So I said, how, how, how do you justify this? And she barged out of the uh, event before going to their highly paid cocktail party to hang out with the Richie Riches. She barged out and she left the event. She couldn't answer the question. So when his own wife couldn't answer the question, when we take a look at the legacy and realize that he was responsible for the murder of Jews, he was responsible for allowing the Arabs to murder Jews. He was responsible for allowing the destruction of hundreds, if not thousands, of Jewish lives and families, orphans. He was responsible, personally responsible for that. And then he was assassinated. I wasn't going to spend very much time talking about him or his assassination. The only reason I spent, like I said at the beginning of the show, the only reason I spent this entire hour talking about this is because a listener wrote in and took the time to write in and ask me why I didn't cover it. So I figured I would spend the time to, uh, to explain it. But I'll be honest with you. Here on Political Hitman, unless there is some other reason for me to bring up Yitzhak Rabin ever again, this is the first and last time I will be speaking about this man on the show. Unless I'm talking about some policy of his or, or if I'm talking about the Oslo Accords and I have to mention him, I will not mention him. I will not spend, I will not spend another minute of my life talking about a man who discriminated against Jews and who was responsible for the deaths of so many and the suffering of many more. I'm not going to waste my time on this. So I wanted to answer the uh, the person who wrote me the email, and I appreciate all feedback that I get. And if you want to send me an email, just go to my page on uh, on israelnewstalkradio.com. My email address is there. Feel free to send me an email. I uh, I, I just wanted to answer the email. It took me an hour to answer it, and I uh, and I appreciate the time. I, I hope you appreciate the time I took to answer it, and I hope I answered the question fully. But I will never speak about this man again. The same way I don't speak about other Jew killers. Unless I have to. It's, uh, it's as simple as that. We, uh, we, 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 we try to not. Uh, I At least I do. I try not to make heroes out of people who hated my brethren who hated my religion, who hated me because I was a religious person. I, I try not to, uh, to pay too much attention to these people. 
and you should too. This should be a universal. This should be a universal thing that we should not pay attention to these people. We should not give them the the honor of of memory. So I'd never gone to a Rabin memorial. I never will go to a Rabin memorial. And once again, I'm never going to talk about him this fully on my show. Again. I'm Howie Sobiger. This is Political Hitman here on Israel News Talk Radio. We're just about out of time. I want to thank you all for listening. I, I appreciate you, uh, you spending some time with me and, uh, and, and, and joining me in this, uh, in, this, in this conversation. I appreciate the fact that you tune in week after week. And uh, I enjoy being here week after week, uh, sharing my thoughts with you and having a discussion with you. In my mind, it's not me giving a monologue. It's, it's us having a discussion. And that's why I keep the lines open. And I always invite you to call in. I always do a live show. I will see you again next week. I'm Howie Silverger. This is Political Hitman on Israel News Talk Radio. If you love Israel News Talk Radio, then you'll love our Facebook page. We keep you up to date on what's happening in Israel, plus little surprise treasures that we don't share on the radio. Go now to follow us on Facebook. Just look for the Israel News Talk Radio Facebook page. And don't forget to subscribe and follow us by clicking on the like button. We post great stuff there that you'll want to share. Israel News Talk Radio on Facebook and Israel News Radio on Twitter. If you're hearing this message, everyone else can too. Advertise with Israel News Talk Radio and get your message out to people. We'll build a personalized package for you. Contact advertising at IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. Straight talk from Israel. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. Hey, this is Jake in Anchorage, Alaska, and I love listening to all the super interesting interviews and up-to-date information on what's happening in Israel. Hello, this is Anna King, originally from London, now living in Israel. And what can I say? Israel News Talk Radio is my cup of tea. My name is Bhaskar. I'm from India, and I love listening because you get to know the truth and wonderful voices from this lovely country. Mom! Okay, wait a minute. Hi, this is Chava Dax, and I'm calling for the rolling hills of Malaya Dumim, just north of Jerusalem. I always listen to Israel News Talk Radio to get all the latest news and commentary and to keep me up to date every day. This is Sarah Dax from Malaya Dumim, and I'm 12. I wish Israel News Talk Radio was boring so my mom wouldn't listen to it all the time. Mom! You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. News, opinion, and more. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio.